Hey, are you a business owner, entrepreneur, or professional? If so, we want you to apply to be a featured guest on our show. My name is Adam Torres, and I host the Mission Matters series of podcasts. I've recorded over 3,000 episodes, and we are just getting started. How do you know if you'd be a good guest to be on the show? Well, only one way to find out, and that's to apply, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We want guests that have a story to tell, guests with a brand, a product, or a service that can benefit my audience of listeners. If this sounds like you, go to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. I'd love to talk to you and get to know more about your story. Again, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, now let's get into the show. Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters, where each and every day I bring on new business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at AskAdamTorres to keep up with my book releases and all the other great stuff we're doing. Um, if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. Today's guest is Mark Seeley, and he is founder and CEO over at Beck Strategies. Mark, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Adam. Oh man, Mark. So uh, we have some great topics to talk about today, and we and I'm excited to get into your ServiceNow platform because you're solving a lot of uh, unique challenges and problems for businesses out there. But maybe just to get us kicked off, give us a little bit of background on Beck Strategies and why you started it. Good question. Um, so Beck Strategies sort of came on organically. I I've been in the ServiceNow ecosystem for about seven years, been in IT industry well over 20 years. Um, always working for someone else and being a number on the payroll, right? Uh, and in recent years with ServiceNow, I, I just liked how they were doing everything in their ecosystem. You know, their idea of helping their customers and, and just having quality. Um, unfortunately, the partner I was I was working with at the time didn't see it ServiceNow's way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, being there and, and watching them, not really giving the customers the true uh, advantage they needed uh, and, and the quality. Um sort of made me say, you know, you know, I need to take this in a different direction on my own. Um, so from there, I, I, I found it back. Um, we weren't obviously initially a ServiceNow partner because I was a one-man show. Uh, I called ServiceNow and they said, well, you know, prove something to us, right? So over the next uh, eight months, uh, we, we proved it, right? We, we started building up slowly and, and I had to jump through a lot of hoops because at the time ServiceNow was not taking any new partners. Uh, but luckily, I knew some folks and we sort of pushed the envelope with with getting things done. Uh, from there, we actually got approved to be a partner in, in 2019 um, and then have, have grown ever since. We we actually were the fastest to become a premier partner in less than two months. Wow. You know, so that was that was pretty uh, good on our part. You know, uh, COVID slowed us down a little bit last year to get to elite status. So we're you know looking to achieve that this year, um, which is their top, top tier. Um, but there was a little slowdown with that, but really it was about quality uh, for the customers and making sure the customers had a partner they can come to for integrity and honesty. Um, and, and I look back and, you know, we've maintained a perfect customer service score um, wow. during this time frame. So uh, something must be working right uh, on that. Um, a, a little bit of tidbit about back and you may not ask me this is, you know, how the name come about, right? Cause it's it obviously has nothing to do with my name. Uh, but it's interesting because the year prior uh, on Father's Day, my daughter gave me a hat, number one dad, you know, and it said Beck. It's like, well, Beck. Well, it's the first initials are all for my kids. So uh, Bella, Evan, Cole, and Kate. So that's where Beck came from. So it is, is dear to me because really we view it as a, a family unit, right? Um, and not just not me, but the employees on staff, right? Um, and And when we look at that as, when we can have a family, right, and, and really show that to our customers, they can sort of feel their part of it too. And we really try and build bonds along those lines and, and, and grow it with that way instead of, you know, just a client vendor relationship. We try and build it closer than that. Uh, and that's really where, where we go from there. That's awesome. And I mean, to, to achieve that rank in, um, in, in two months, I mean, that, that's a big deal. So you're doing something right over there at Beck. Um, like, what do you think is some of that, like, uh, what's that secret sauce? Like the mission, the culture, like, h- how are you pulling this off, especially this growth? I mean, because it's not easy to do. It's a competitive field. It's extremely competitive. Uh, and there's a lot of great competition out there. Mm-hmm. 
Um, uh, luckily, there's some not so great, and, and, and a lot of customers, you know, uh, you know, the, the customers will typically look for a new partner, not necessarily a new platform, right? They know ServiceNow is great. Sometimes they get a bad taste in their mouth. So um, luckily, that's when we can come in and say, you know, we do things differently. Um, but really, it's been, you know, like I say, the, the integrity and honesty to our customers. Um, and we and we try and be a family unit to see that. And, and a good example is, you know, we had one of our uh, one of our folks just Sunday night um, put out on Teams of all things on a Sunday night mm-hmm. that his son got a scholarship to a college in, in North Carolina, and everybody in the company is on Teams congratulating him and everything else. Not on Facebook, not on Instagram. It's on Teams, right? So, so you you see a different culture when you see that instead of you know, people will say, oh, I'm not getting on Teams. It's Sunday night. That's Monday morning stuff. Um, and even at that, then they'd ignore it too because, right, it has nothing to do with work, um, but not here. And then on, on the flip side of that is we bring sort of the customers into that same culture. We'll actually integrate them into our teams um, so they can, you know, be part of that. But um, it's one step more is when our customers call us for anything, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it may have some, nothing to do with what we do, uh, but they're like, hey, have you seen this latest government policy how does that affect us on service now or you know we saw this finance thing can we do that there right Mm. and we're the first phone call it's not to somebody else Uh, and sometimes you know we have to say service now has nothing to do with that but um but they appreciate the honesty in what we're doing and the other thing is you know it's 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 bringing in the right people so even if we don't have the folks on staff our customers want to deal with us so we'll bring in experts from other partners or bring contractors that have the right certifications they need, the right expertise. So that's portrayed to our customers that, hey, we're not saying we can do it all and then floundering about and, and, and burning through hours. We make sure that we're actually getting the right people for the right job. Um, so overall, that's sort of been the, the secret sauce, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's just that just bringing everything in, into more of a, a family atmosphere instead of just a vendor client relationship um, and, and just stay in our own course. You know, we don't, we don't buy into some of the fads or the ambulance chasing of, you know, this is what happened last year and so forth. You know, it's what we do. We just stay on that course. So um, I think they appreciate that, you know, it's because there's a lot of partners like change gears last year with COVID, right? We didn't, we just did our thing. Our, our clientele knew, you know, who they were coming to. Uh, and we just, we stayed with that. And so, I'd say that's the, that's the secret sauce. It's it's really simple, actually. At the end of the day, so uh, you're you're also going over and above. So in, in certain areas. So tell me a little bit more about the Skill Bridge program and how that's working out. Sure. Um, so that's actually been an interesting program for us, and we haven't had it for a long period of time. We we kicked it off last summer, but that came about in, in another strange way. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from from one of our, our partners. And they said they were doing this veteran program. Uh, and, and could we use some of these veterans if they got certified? And I said, well, you know, let's let's see how they do. Um, so they were actually putting veterans who had already been, you know, out of the military for a while. And, and they're putting them through all these certifications. But they couldn't get them hired anywhere because mm-hmm. they, they, they couldn't pass an interview. Uh, it, you know, and not that they were ignorant or anything like that. It's the fact that just because they had certification didn't know what they, they didn't know what they were doing. Right. You know, that's a piece of paper. Um, that's memorization. Right. So I said, well, you're going about it the wrong way. You're not really helping them mm-hmm. achieve the next level. You're just giving them a test and a cert. What you need to do is get them hands on through the process, but not just working with the tool. It's working with the customers. Right. Yeah. How they interact with the customers, get them on those phone calls so they can hear what's going on, hear the vocabulary that's being used. Um, to really get inundated in the ecosystem. And then on top of that, what's their social media marketing, right? Because we, we all have LinkedIn, right? And that's, that's a, a staple. If you're in business, you have LinkedIn. Um, you know, what's their LinkedIn say? What's their resume look like when they're talking about service now? So we don't just look at it as, hey, we're going to bring you in for this certification. We're bringing you in to make you successful. So uh, from that veteran program, we actually brought them all onto back. Um, all those veterans um, and, and, and continued their training here. Um, so that was, a, that was a lift and shift at the beginning of last year. Uh, and, and we have a number of them actually staying with us right now um, that have continued on here. 
Um, and then others we've placed other places because, you know, we got them to the point where we could make phone calls and get them placed out. But, you know, it was just that success. So I said, well, we really need to start this sooner for mm-hmm. these folks. So DOD has set up a skill bridge program. What that is, is anybody in the DOD military transitioning their last six months, they can intern or go to school for the last six months at a company. Uh, so, and, and they're fully paid by the DOD. Um, we're actually just bringing them in to sort of inundate them into the, the public, the private sector, right? Um, so we bring them in, we get them on a certification plan. They have entire roadmap, just like going to school. Um, but as they get each cert, they get more responsibility. So, you know, passing the first cert, that's learning tech, you know, vocabulary, things like that. Then they start doing tickets, right? They're actually helping customers. Um, once they get to the next cert, they're, they're on customer calls, project calls, you know, starting getting inundated with that. Um, obviously, interaction with our team mm-hmm. helps that. And But from day one, we say, look, you're now an employee of Beck. Let's get it on your social media. You know, you're in the ecosystem. So we start building that up over the time frame. So we had our first folks actually join um, August last year. Um, so our first wave is sort of graduating next month uh, of that. But we're actually having new folks joining our school bridge every month. So it's just wow. growing and expanding. Uh, we're looking forward to the new year with a whole bunch. We have, I think we have four or five starting next week, um, actually. So, uh, you know, it's moving and grooving. But, you know, that's really is just to make those folks successful. And they don't have to have an IT background. They could be a medic that wants to change their field of study, right? Um, some of IT backgrounds, so that's great. That's helpful. Um, but you can really come into it with anything. Um, and then on top of that, it shows our clientele, the type of folks we have on staff, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this, the, the integrity, the drive, the organization, you know, things that come from the military into the private sector, you know, they know our staff's going to maintain that. And then the camaraderie amongst the folks, right? We're really a unit here, whether we be Navy, Army, Air Force, and so forth. And we have folks from every branch. So that's worked out well. Um, even some Marines, um, but, you know, just bringing those folks together, but our customers see that. So that helps out. And then on top of that, you have government projects, right? Mm-hmm. They always require clearances. Um, so uh, especially when it's IT, you know, you have to have clearances to do that. So this actually taps into a market of, we can bring in folks that have clearances, get them certified and get them into the ecosystem. Yeah. Cause the big shortfall right now for service now is, there's people that have certifications, but no clearances, mm-hmm. right? It's hard to get those after the fact, right? Veterans that have been out for five years, experience the, the clearances have expired, right? So, so we're actually tapping into folks that they're going to have active clearances, you know, for a long period of time. And so we're getting them trained up and we can get them onto those projects and, and get the right personnel going. What a great success story. I love it. I love it. Really um, solving a need on both sides for both, obviously, the, the DOD and the government, but also for, you know, the individuals that have, that, as you mentioned, are um, are transitioning out of the military that have already served their country. So, I mean, it's just a really great success story overall. Uh, I, I want to switch gears a bit, Mark, and I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, change in IT and why, I mean, there's a lot going on right now. So we're recording this just for, for reference for the audience. We're recording this at the beginning of 2021. Lots of change going on, of course, in, in the world in general right now, but also specifically in technology. A lot of businesses that maybe weren't really, um, maybe they were a little bit behind on the tech side and the IT side are now finding themselves in a place to where they can't be anymore. Like the world has changed and now whether they like it or not, or whether for whatever reason, it's time to catch up, um, to stay relevant relevant in their market or field. So Mark, what, what, what are some of the reasons that you feel that some businesses struggle with kind of making these changes in IT and adapting? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. And really, it applies more to larger companies than, than smaller ones. Um, you would think smaller ones because maybe they don't have the budgetary um, mm-hmm. needs there or budgetary um, funds there to move forward. Um, but they're smaller to adapt. Um, and when you're smaller on scale, it's quicker to adapt to different things. But really, it has to do with um, a, a few things, right? First of all, culture. You know, change is always a difficult thing for anybody um, as you move forward. And, and we find that every day when we go into a new project, people don't want to change processes. Well, the reason we're there is because the processes weren't working. 
Um, so for we, and we always have that contentious moment and it's like, well, that's why you brought us in, right? Cause you, you're looking for change. Yeah. So, so change is always just hard, but you know, to keep up technology is changing constantly. It's ever changing. Uh, you have uh, hackers out there, uh, forcing change on security. Uh, you have government policies forcing change on, on your governance risk and compliance. You know, they come out with a new policy. All of a sudden, all the old audits you were doing on a regular basis are out the door. You need something new. Um, so it's outside factors that typically push a lot of this. And it's hard to keep up with that. It's hard for us to keep up with it sometimes. Um, but when, when you look at what's happened, especially the past year, you mentioned the past year, yeah. you know, there's a lot of move to the cloud, right? Um, and, and more and more work from home. And, and we know that not everybody's going to go back to the office once, once this whole thing's passed because we know we'll get past it. Um, but people need to adapt to that. So when you have that, obviously that created more security issues, right? The uh, dual authentications, things like that, where companies had to work on the fly. You know, how are we going to have a thousand people that were working in an office building that we had a secure network, all of a sudden we've sent them home, but they still have to work. So obviously that's dynamic. They had to move quickly. Uh, so you have budgetary restrictions, right? That, that's a simple one. Large corporations, they're so inundated with the tools they've been using forever. For them to migrate off of it would take a long period of time uh, and, and a lot of cost, but they know they need to do it. Um, but that keeps them behind the eight ball, right? Where they're moving off of it, they're still two versions behind somebody else, right? Because the companies are still moving forward with new technology. So it's hard to keep up in that area. And then the different business needs. Um, so Every company, every year, you have new marketing strategies, right? There's new HR and compliance. So those play a bigger factor in the IT world nowadays than just IT. You have the business needs that are always ever growing. And one of the main things we see recently is end user experience, right? Uh, then, and that sounds, you know, what is that? Um, well, it's what we do every day at home. We get on Amazon. We have a certain experience there. We get on Google, you know, whatever it be. You know, we have a certain experience when we're doing that, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what site you buy from or, or what site or, or social media. And people, when they go to work, they want to have that same atmosphere. You know, that's what they're used to. That's right on their phone, you know, going through life like that. So that's pushed the envelope with IT to say, hey, we can't push out a product to our business units to say this is the best tool for the company anymore, because that's what used to happen. IT would study, they'd analyze, this one's going to solve the problems. Let's get this rolled out to everybody. Now you have the end users come back and say, hey, wait a minute. I want this great experience. I don't want this tool that, yeah, it does the job for me. I want to have fun doing it. I want to be relaxed. I want it on my phone. You know, that's, so you have a lot of this pushback from different departments and, and different business units to say, we need this experience. So when you look at a CIO, for instance, uh, They've always been sort of the driver technology-wise within a business. Now they're changing roles, right? Their technology, it, it, you know, uh, tech ideas and, and, and knowledge are always going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but now they have to think at it from a different point of view, a business point of view. What is my end user going to experience what, when I put this in front of them? Mm -hmm. So it's made a shift in how they think. And then that's going to trickle down because now you have the different departments saying, you know, we need this in place. We need this in place. Well, when you start doing that, then you realize, wait a minute, we have 20 different platforms. <laughs> so how do I get the same user experience across all these different platforms? Because we knew this platform did this great job and this one did this great job. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, I can't keep controlling all these different facets. I mean, that's crazy. Um, so when you look at ServiceNow, and, and you know that's what we do, it's got everybody on the same platform. Mm -hmm. So when I go into a company, you know, and they're on service now, you can have your security department on it. You have your operations, your man, your service management, your HR, your governance and risk and compliance. They're on the same platform. Mm -hmm. So from a CIO, I'm saying, well, this is easy, right? Because now I can put the same portal in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. They're all going to have the same user experience. And I'm worried about one tool, not 20 different tools or, or hundreds the average company out there has roughly 90 security tools. That's when I first saw that number, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. 
And then when I've been talking to different companies, I'm like, well, what security tools? And they start listing them. I'm like, you really do have 90. That's, that's crazy. Like, how would you even understand what you're doing? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, they don't, right? That's the problem. They have 90 different tools and they're not paying attention to half of them. They just added a new one on, added a new one on. Well, who's managing this thing? So when you get everybody on the same platform, then you have a more strict guideline, better management, you know, uh, just more conducive to the entire environment. I see that completely. As you're talking about user experience, I've, I mean, I've had this conversation quite a few times um, just with just other business leaders. And it's interesting, number one, if you're, if, if your um, employees or, or, or clients for that matter, if they're, you know, picking up their cell phone and having a better experience with, uh, with the new app than they are with like coming to when they come to work and then they're, uh, and then they're, you know, using your internal systems to do an HR request or something simple. If they feel like that's something that they would have used maybe 10, 15 years ago, your user experience for your employees, I mean, it matters now. It, it, it functions into their, um, their retention, their quality of living at work, like all these things, it causes stress now to not have the right um, technology and the right tools to do to do what you feel is, is necessary in your job. So that user experience, I mean, it's huge and it's changed now because I remember like so when I was entering the workforce years ago, coming into a, I worked for a really large company at that time, financial services firm. And even back then, when I, uh, when I was, you know, just doing little things like an HR request, it was so frustrating to me. So I can't even imagine now I'm in a whole different space, but I can't even imagine now if big companies like that are using those same systems, what the more advanced, at least technology wise, I would argue the younger generation that's coming in the workforce, they come in and they open up their, their um, browser and they're like, wait, you want me to do what? Like I have to submit, how does this, like, what is this even, what is this? <laughs> so I, I get what you're saying completely, Mark, and, and it matters. Um, and you look at competition for talent and you look at the other side of that and you're like, uh, who, 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 who does a company choose ultimately? So, I mean, all great points you made. And um, I want to I want to focus a little bit more now on on service now in general. We've talked about it, but for everybody for everybody out there that hasn't um, heard of it or obviously used the platform yet, um, tell us a little bit more just about the platform overall. Sure. So service now is uh, so it's been called a lot of different things as far as what it does, um, but really it's a platform that tries to make work work easier. Um, and that sounds a little weird, um, but that's really the goal, right? We want work to be easier for us mm-hmm. um, as we go through our day. And that's that user experience. Um, you know, my, my first touch on ServiceNow uh, roughly six, seven years ago was actually analyzing it to compare it to other tools um, and specifically for event management and what it could do in that space. Um, and at the time, it was sort of young. Um, for that for that space because uh, it was the new player on the market um, but, and they didn't really have some of the, the different things I needed to see uh, materialized at that time mm-hmm. but you could see that where it was going right so one of the, when you look at service now uh, they, they initially came out and said hey we're the tool that you can customize however you want to customize well I did IBM for 15 years and I know that's a bad idea Right. When you come out and tell everybody they can customize whatever they want to do. Now, obviously, I was on the flip side. IBM says don't customize at all. Right. That's they're sort of like, no, don't do that. Well, every business is different. So you have to treat them differently. Mm-hmm. Um, so what ServiceNow did, and they, they realized we, that that was probably a bad idea initially. So they started putting in different releases each, you know, twice, two releases each year. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they've done is built in what those customers were customizing into the platform. Um, so at the end of the day, you have actually customers that are sort of driving development. Wow. You know, different business departments. And, and that, that to me was the trigger. So when I really saw that happening, you know, that's when I started drinking Kool-Aid because I said, that's, that's the right ticket because, you know, you're not telling them, no, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. You know, we're such and such and we know better than you. But on the other side, customize everything you want you're never going to advance, right? Because you're always going to be going back to the drawing board. What did we do back two years ago? And we need to fix that. So okay. here was a way that they could take that and, and put it together. So that was that was the, the big ticket that punched their, their clock to, 
to drive to where they are today. So when I when I look at that, you know, that's that was taken in the right account. And then when you look at the end user experience that we've already talked about, mm-hmm. you know, the idea was is how do the the folks using the platform, you know, actually have a use a better workday. Mm-hmm. And it's really workflows. So the backbone of the service now is not necessarily a a code uh, built into it or or some magic sauce with alerts or something like that. It's actually workflows. Mm-hmm. And, and what that means is just to give you more tidbit is when I, when you look at the platform um, or in the IT industry, you have tools for service management, operations management, HR, uh, and so forth for every different department. What they've done is said, well, we have this base platform. The base platform is your user experience, service portal, you know, virtual agents to talk to folks, different things like that. And on top of it, we're going to plug in all those other things, mm. the service management, the operations management, so forth. So when you plug in all those things, everybody's on that same platform. Mm-hmm. So if I create a workflow from service management or, or HR is always a good one, onboarding folks, because that's one of the most difficult parts of HR's daily job is onboarding yeah. a new employee. They send emails everywhere. If they can put in a ticket through a service portal to say, hey, we're onboarding this new employee, and that immediately gets routed to a service management team, uh, you know, email team, you know, whoever they are, where they are on the platform, everybody's working in unison. And that's where it comes together is that one workflow just went across 10 different departments to make sure this employee is actually on board faster and more accurately because everybody's working off the stick instead of emails shooting out everywhere, which is the old style and people missing emails, right? Or didn't get an approval, but I'm approving right in this workflow and I'm working out of this workflow, doing my updates to it, because you're going to get tasks assigned to you. And then you have a better user experience for that HR person. Mm-hmm. You have a better user experience for the person being onboarded. Didn't even know they were getting a better user experience mm-hmm. um, because, you know, they might be getting an email saying, hey, go in and, and watch these videos on the portal, mm-hmm. right? Just from, just from onboarding. So they're actually getting the benefit of that. But you also have a better user experience for all those different departments that aren't frustrated Mm-hmm. at getting a thousand emails or getting inundated. Hey, you didn't do this, getting a phone call. Have you gotten that thing set up yet? And so forth. So everyone is actually getting a better experience from a workflow. So when you look at make work easier, right? That's making work easier. So that that's, that's the backbone of the entire system. Now, Talk I'm, about time. I mean, because ultimately what you're doing here is you're saving time. And I mean, time is money in this case and resources. Let's talk about like time and, and just workflows and how that works. Because I know there's some people watching this right now that like you hit a pain point for me where I'm like, oh, you miss an email or you missed something. And you're like, oh, it doesn't have to be an onboard and it can be on anything. Um, and you're like, oh, and you can and that say, you know, that, that can be a bad thing for a lot of reasons. But let's talk about like time and time savings, like what kind of the things you've seen. Yeah, so so when you look at time savings, and I've been doing event management for mm-hmm. eons, um, and, and time savings is a big thing. Mm-hmm. So you can look at at a hundred different ways. Um, you have an outage, right? Um, we know that's a big deal, especially depending on what went down, could be costing you know millions of dollars in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, but time to resolution, right? If the right people are notified in the right order in the right amount of time, you're getting things resolved quicker which is getting things back in motion. And, and that's very strategic because, you know, uh, prior to that, you would have one department would actually get a notification of some sort. And then they get on the phone and try and find the right person to actually work on the job and, and so forth. And, and, and how much time did I just lose there? Maybe an hour, you know, it could be more than that, depending on what's going on over the weekend, you know, everybody's out, you know, at the movies or, or baseball or something. Um, so you could be losing, losing, losing a lot of time. When you work at, when you look at this platform, you could basically say, Hey, this alert came in. It doesn't even need to go to a person at that point. It Mm. can get routed right to the right department or right to an automation. An automation could actually kick off something and maybe restart a server or something without even needing human intervention. So time savings can, can be astronomical when you look at it. Um, The onboarding process, that's always a good one because, you know, typically, Onboarding takes takes a week, two weeks, because what we don't realize is 
we say your orientation day is today, but HR started with you two weeks ago, yeah. right? Just to get you set up for orientation day, which we know your stuff's still not done. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a case like this, as soon as they launched that first ticket, it went out to all the different departments and possibly to you at home mm-hmm. to go in, hey, watch these onboarding videos, you know, you know, start checking your security passwords and things like that before you show up for day one. And day one, all of a sudden, you don't have orientation anymore. You're getting right to work. Yeah. So what do I do? I'm not paying you to sit there for another week of orientation. I'm actually, hey, today's day one and you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. At the same time, HR saying, that was easy, right? We, we, we put in a ticket and they're onboarded. Um, and so the time savings there, so they can actually get to doing other work because we found that onboarding and offboarding take the majority of HR's time. When you get in a workflow like this, you're actually knocking that down 90%. Wow, what they have to do. It, it's astronomical. Um, and then just the cost savings there. And, that, and that's just one department. Mm-hmm. When you look at GRC, which is a whole nother beast, uh, some audits actually take six months to do. Mm. And now to me, that's like, you're working on one thing for six months. That seems a little crazy, but they're doing it so manually with spreadsheets mm-hmm. that they have to check all these boxes and they go through it. And I actually uh, ran into, I was doing one project and there was a person as soon as they finished the audit, the next day they started over on it because <laughs> it took them so long. And, and I'm not even exaggerating. I said, say that to me again. <laughs> you complete the audit and then you start over on it. And she's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I do. I said, so how do you achieve getting all your other work done? She goes, well, it's very difficult. Typically mm-hmm. I work a lot of extra hours. Well, that's not really fair, right? You know, especially when when we know salaried employees are not getting overtime, right? They're, they're not really volunteering for that. Yeah. Um, so I said, okay, well, if I can automate that audit for you and say now you're only taking two days to do it, then then how much more of the other stuff can you do? And would you be working those extra hours? Said, well, no, of course not, right? Because you know, something that was taking her six months to do, and then she had to start over on it. You know, wow. I just saved her life. <laughs> it was wow. probably taking years off her life at that point because I'm sure an audit probably, you know, I don't know the stress level going yeah. through that, but, you know, she's got to be under a lot of stress. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a prime example for, for us to have a success when you look at something like this, because when you look at this platform of a GRC module where I can automate your audits for you and plug those into government policies and regulations mm-hmm. to where we're actually getting those right over the Internet. And the old school scenario was, is you would do each audit um, and each individually. Well, with the platform, we can say, well, wait a minute. If I type out this one requirement, that actually covers six different audits at wow. once. I can apply it across all those. You're not sitting there doing the same thing six times. You're doing it one time and we're automatically applying it to all these different things. So, you know, when, when you look at time savings, mm-hmm. astronomical, from alert management all the way through onboarding audits. It's just crazy. So I feel like your description just now, probably just uh, like a bunch of people watching this are going to be like, "Uh, yeah, that would be really nice. Tell me more about this workflow and these automations, but I don't want to get everybody too excited before you tell me uh, who, who are the right type of companies and, or if there's specific niches that are, that are a, a good fit to typically work with Beck. Well, really, you know, you don't have to be a certain type of company. Um, because at the end of the day, we all have these same problems, you know, maybe not to the same degree as someone else. Maybe it's a little bit different, but every customer we go into And one of the things we try and do, because, you know, you're, you're never going to know every company and say, you're the right company for us. Yeah. Right. So what we do is say, you know what, you're looking for the same resolution, the same, the same savior to come in as far as a tool to, to help you with these problems. So what we do is when we first you know, get a hold of a, a client, we go through and t- have them tell us about them, right? It's not really us telling them about us. It's, it's them telling us mm-hmm. you know, about them. How do they work? What are their processes? Why do they do things a certain way? And then we take that and say, you know what? Based on what you told us, this is how we're going to help you set up your system. Mm-hmm. And, and this is how we're going to build those workflows for you. And when you look at that, it doesn't have to be a manufacturing company. 
it, it could be a finance company. It could be uh, a state university. You know, it could be a healthcare company. You know, actually the only, the only industry we have not worked with our, ourselves to this point is higher education. Hmm. Um, we've actually worked in finance, healthcare, um, <clears throat> manufacturing, uh, you know, government, we're doing government work, state and, and federal government, because they really have the same problems. You know, uh, they sit there and say, well, we're completely different, right? We're, we're, we're a finance company and, that, and you're, you've been helping healthcare. Well, you know what healthcare has the same as finance company? It has an HR department. Mm-hmm. It has a governance department. It has a security department. It has an IT department. Every company, every industry has those same departments. Mm-hmm. Now, you have different little nuances on how you do different business. But at the end of the day, you're really tracking those same departments no matter where you are. And that was an interesting thing because when I got first more into the marketplace myself, I didn't understand that, right? Yeah. I got called for a project at Gap, right? Now, I, I flew out to San Francisco, met with those folks. And the whole time I'm thinking, what does Gap need this for? Don't they make jeans, right? You know, it, you just don't think of these things. And that, and true story, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, they make jeans. What, why do they need this? I, I, when I showed up at their center, they had an entire command center wow. for IT. And I didn't realize that they own tons of different magazines that are global. Wow. They own so much more <laughs> than just making <laughs> jeans. And I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is interesting, right? This is, I never thought, you know, when, when you look at it, mm-hmm. that all these companies are doing this. And that sort of like turned on that light bulb for me. It was like, wait a minute, because I'm in the IT industry. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. I have to work just for an IT company, right? IT means I can work for any company, you know, just like auditing and HR, you can work for any company. And, and that was, uh, you know, that was a little earlier in my career that I got that light bulb. I was like, this is interesting, you know? Uh, and, and so that we sort of take that mentality with us when we're doing these projects across the board to say, you know what, you actually have the same problems. You make jeans, but you have all these IT and HR and yeah. governance problems that this bank does, right? Maybe not to the same extent, depending on, you know, you know Govern, government yeah. policies and, and protections, but you really have the same problems. And so that became interesting to me. And, and to a degree they do, because you're talking about a company that ships things globally, right? They have to do with international trade on top of that, right? So you, know, you start expanding the scope of what do these people actually do instead of just making a product. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so really any company at the end of the day can get involved with service now. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. And, and that's helpful. Uh, and so, Mark, first off, it's been great having you on the show today. I mean, I learned a lot. I hope our viewers did also. If somebody is listening to this and they want to learn more about Beck and they want to connect with you to, to really explore that ServiceNow platform and maybe how, how it can help them. I mean, what's the best way for them to reach out and to connect with you and your team? Uh, you know, there, there's so many ways we have going on. We are on every social media pretty much. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, obviously our website, beckstrategies.com. And then actually you can go right into ServiceNow to find a partner, right? We're, we're right there in the listing. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, reach out, you know, uh, for, for a company that you want to work with, a perfect CSAT score is, is a, a good way to go. Um, but any of those platforms work for us. Fantastic. Well, Mark, really appreciate you coming on the show today and telling us a little bit more about your story over at Beck Strategies and all the great work that you're doing for your clients through ServiceNow. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. We want you to be a return viewer, return listener. I'll have a lot more great guests just like Mark coming up for you. And Mark, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it.